Henry, great to meet you, man. Thanks so much for taking some time to come on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Good to have you, man. And you know, we always like to get this show started with a little bit of background on who you are and how you got to be doing what you're doing at the current moment. So I'm a global citizen. It's the first thing to know about me. So I have a very global outlook. I sound American, but my mother's Czech. My father's British. I was born in Hong Kong and I grew up in Hong Kong, Tokyo, Germany, Czech Republic, graduated high school in Russia. And then I went, um, you know, to Canada and I decided to study there. I thought I was going to be a diplomat with all my languages and global experience. And I got really kind of tired from the public sector when I was doing some internships. I thought it was too slow. It wasn't really uh, good for me. It wasn't fast moving enough. But I was interested in climate change. I was uh, studying climate induced migration and water wars at the time, both kind of environmental security questions. I said, I really need to find something related to business and climate change. And so that sort of led me to here, which we can talk more about what I do, but that's sort of the background on me. Um, After my undergraduate degree in political science, I studied food security and urban agriculture to sort of dip my toes and see if this was an area that I thought I would be interested in, a sort of online certificate program from Ryerson University in Toronto. And then I um, bought a one-way ticket to New York with big dreams of being an urban farmer and sort of hustled in New York a little bit and got into Columbia University and got my master's in sustainability management. Cool. Where do you think your, your accent comes from? I think it's because I went to a lot of American schools. I think American TV is kind of proliferated around the world. So I had a lot of teachers that were American, a lot of friends, a lot of watching friends on TV and Seinfeld. So I think that's where it comes from. Yeah. <laughs> but my, my dad has a British accent. My mom has a Czech accent. It's kind of a funny family. That is, that, that's really interesting. Yeah. People say, so I've lived in Colorado for like almost 10 years now. And people say that my New Jersey accent is kind of dissipated, but I, I don't know. I don't know what they're talking about. Like, I just feel like it's, it's still there. <laughs> you got to turn it on when you but, want um, to, right? <laughs> <laughs> so how do you think your international background has shaped your perspective on the whole planet, the way humans live and specifically how we can improve our society, whether it's as a Americans or as a global people in general? Well, I think one of the ways it really shaped me is just having an understanding that local context really matters. I think very often we get stuck in what we know and what has worked before and what interests us. In contrast to that, I sort of approach everything with a lot of openness because I understand throughout my life that people are different and not nothing is better than the other. There's always trade-offs to every culture, every technology, every city, every approach. And I sort of like to embrace that nuance. And so anything I do now in my work in agriculture focuses on what is happening on the ground, what is the local context from a social, environmental, and economic perspective that's going to really drive success in this region and in whatever project I'm working on. So I think it's really made a huge, huge difference. It's also made a difference in my ability to make friends and to network because I'm very good at listening and finding common ground because of the diverse experiences that I've had the privilege to have from a very early age. How do you define success? I think success for me is, you know, joy in what you do. Like, do you wake up every morning and are you excited about what you're going to do that day? Uh, I think that's how I define success, you know, and, and are you looking forward to what's coming next? That's what success is to me, is just being able to enjoy yourself and have a good time, be satisfied. I like that you use the word joy rather than happiness, because joy is kind of a lasting feeling. You can be joyful when you're struggling and trying and really doing trying hard to build something in a uh, in a a situation where it it might look bleak, but you know that you're trying your best and you're really putting your best foot forward rather than just trying to be more hedonistic and just be happy all the time. I think it's a good distinction to draw for people. Happiness is an emotion. Joy is kind of like more spiritual. It's an everlasting thing. So I I like your usage of that word. I'm I'm wondering how you sounds like you came at this from a a sustainability, help as many people as possible climate angle. And with your diverse background, that makes a lot of sense. But why did this lead you into focusing on food production in particular? Yeah, so I didn't know I was going to get into food, right? Like I didn't have a green thumb. I grew up in big cities. I didn't grow up on a farm. I had a little bit of exposure to agriculture when my parents, um, when I was about 14 years old, uh, invested in a country house outside of Prague in the Czech Republic. And that was where on the weekends I would have to sort of help my mom with the flower garden or my dad with the raised beds or building a greenhouse. 
And my both my mom and my dad are pretty good gardeners, and they just sort of had that as part of the sort of baby boomer generation. And, you know, honestly, I didn't like it as a teenager, but, um, you know, there were certain benefits to it, you know, eating the beautiful local food and the delicious food and sharing it with our neighbors. And I didn't really care about it much as a teenager. But then when I was, uh, you know, older, when I was maybe in my early 20s uh, and I was really thinking about climate change some more, I started thinking about how is this going to work? Like, what, what is this? What are we, how are we going to solve this enormous problem? And because of my policy background and because of what I'd analyzed, looking at realism and some of the paradigms of you know, political science, I was really pessimistic that we're going to sort of get together as a global society, hold hands, uh, stop emitting, you know, stop polluting, and work together to prevent climate change. And so, you know, as I started exploring climate change, there was sort of two camps. There was mitigation and adaptation, and we need both. And for me, I thought that mitigation was something that was a very long, arduous journey that I didn't necessarily think I was going to make the biggest impact in or wasn't as I wasn't as passionate about it. And so adaptation was the thing that mattered to me a lot. And as someone who grew up in cities and kind of understands the dynamism of cities and the potential there and how quickly things can change, I said, well, most of our population lives in cities. This is where the change is going to happen. If it's going to happen from the bottom up, like it's going to happen from the people in the cities. And cities are huge uh, contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. And cities themselves are not really designed to interact with nature, right? They're sort of like these constructed, safe, you know, economic engines uh, apart from nature. And so I thought there was sort of a, a potential for something to change there. And so I decided to investigate three different urban topics related to cities and create three different blogs to explore my ideas and to test what I was passionate about and to test what my audience might be passionate about. So I had some blogging experience at the time in the early days of blogging about 12 years ago. And so I started one called Technology Water, which was about new technologies for water management, a little bit of an urban focus, but I think more broadly across technology and water. Another one was called Urban Layering. It was about this idea of what if we created density that went in layers as opposed to up vertically. So imagine like long pedestrian pathways, bikeways, different ways of interacting with the city so you don't have to travel as far uh, in the same way. And then I started agritecture, which is the idea of bringing architectural thinking to farming in the city. And I used both, all of the, all three of them for about six months, managed them. Um, and then agriculture just was by far the most popular and was the most interesting to me. There was constantly new content coming up. There was a lot of confusion about a lot of skepticism about urban agriculture. There was a really important place for my analytical global lens. And um, the community was very active and engaged. So I just decided to dump the other two and focus my energies on agriculture. And, and that's when it started as a, as a blog in 2010, 2011. Wow. And what were you doing um, for work when you were doing these three blogs? I mean, at the time I was finishing my undergraduate degree in political science. So I, I was still at the end of that. And I had a job um, as a blogger for Royal Bank of Canada uh, focused on millennial issues and then I also was doing some other work. I worked at Zara for a little while as in retail. I, I was a lifeguard at the university pool. Uh, I was doing a lot of different jobs. I, I had to sort of raise money for my last semester of school. So I sort of took a semester off and I did those three jobs and then finished school while doing one of the jobs and, and blogging. Yeah. So I try to produce maybe like two, three blog posts per week, but most of it was really like syndicated. I would pick a blog post and then I would I pick content, like I'd find a company and I would say, this is interesting because of this. And I do like one to two paragraphs of analysis. I didn't do full on comprehensive blog posts until a bit later. Um, and that worked for me because, and I was using Tumblr at the beginning. So Tumblr was, you know, kind of notorious for being able to sort of repost things and share things and then add your comment to it. So it was, it was a relatively manageable um, and something I, I loved. Like, again, I was just so into it. I wanted to like, just do, do that all the time. And then I started visiting farms and, and reporting on farms. And I, I started running some workshops after the first year. I just sort of started to test waters and try new features and try new ways to engage with my audience. Have you always found yourself to be like a gifted writer and communicator? Is that something that just was easy for you always? Um, I think my mom is a very good communicator. She's a good public speaker. Um, so I grew up in a house where with that. I wanted to be an actor for a little while when I was younger. So I was always performing in school plays. And I think that gave me certain skills. 
And then um, I grew up Mormon and Mormons uh, speak a lot in church, right? Even as a young person, you would often teach a lesson or speak in front of a, a community, a, a congregation of 300 people. So you learn some skills there as well. And prior to starting my blog, I, you know, I went on my Mormon mission. And so I had the experience of meeting new people every day, interacting with them, learning how to communicate with them, uh, training people. So I, I got a lot of these skills early on. I don't know if I'm a natural, but I definitely sp have spent a lot of time uh, working on it. Well, I think your story is incredible and I'm excited to get kind of deeper into it because you might not be an American, but you seem like the definition of the American dream. Like you were hustling and trying to yeah. create a, an audience and getting into what you're interested in. And then you've created this whole brand and business out of just something you were passionate about, which I think is really cool. So can you kind of describe how this blog then turned into a full like company that you now run as is are you CEO founder? What's your what's your title? Yeah, I'm, I'm the founder and CEO of Agritecture, and I'll just tell you that journey. I think it's an interesting one that people can learn from. So I think the first thing to remember is like I, I had this blog as a side gig in addition to everything else, right? It didn't make me money for a long time. And it was something that I was happy to experiment with and play with. It was like a hobby. Um, but but I, I made it very... Uh, I made it very strategic. So it's something I tell a lot of people is like, if you're going to have something you're trying to dip your toes into, make sure you build an archive of data. And so as I would research things, I built my own internal archive of information. How much investment went into this farm? How many companies have used this technology? How big is this farm? What are they growing? What are they doing? And so I started building like not only just an understanding of the sector and through the content I was creating, but I created an actual asset for me. And I started to find consistency between these various uh, projects, uh, the similar problems, uh, similar successes, similar strategies, similar techniques. And that gave me an interesting strategic lens um, that built me up to where I am now. So what did I do with that? Well, the first thing I did with that was I started to experiment with workshops. And I started to say, look, I really want to meet the people from my audience to confirm what I think they want, what I think they're feeling, and what I think their hopes and dreams are to see where the gap is that I can fill. Because business is about finding a niche, finding a gap, and filling it better than anyone else. And so that was the objective so that I could turn this into a business. So in order to do that, I had to go further into the market research. And so I, I started running agriculture design workshops. And these workshops were basically where we would bring together dream teams for urban farms. So we'd have an architect, an engineer, a sustainability manager, a grower, uh, an I think an entrepreneur, a marketing professional, about like seven to 10 people. And we would build three teams. I'd pick a site and I would sort of provide a lecture about my understanding of urban agriculture, best practices. And then I would basically let them run loose. And they had to present a business plan for the project and compete. And then we'd have like a prize that we would announce on the website, on the blog. So that's how I started connecting with my community in person. And what that did is it took my archive and it let me test the knowledge that I was sharing with people in real life to see the value it was giving them, which improved my reputation and my relationship with the audience, and my ability to deliver content to them, but also created um, a methodology, right? Now I have this methodology for how do you plan farms that I developed and tested and improved. And so again, I was running these workshops and I was working at the same time. So I was either in school or working and I was just honestly doing this all on the side. It was a little crazy. And then, um, especially when I was in Columbia, because it was just so expensive to do the degree and I had to work a ton in addition to study a ton. But when I graduated from Columbia, I had some job offers. Uh, two of them were in the sector and one of them was sort of peripheral to the sector. And I had a difficult decision to make. And so I, I said, this is probably 2013. So I said, you know, either I can take a job in the sector and go right into this and get the experience, or I can take a job sort of peripheral to the sector. When I say peripheral, it was a water company that had technology for high-tech farming systems, also fish farming systems, aquaculture, things like that. So it was related, but it wasn't like a farm, like some of the other offers that I had had. So I said, you know what, I'm not gonna work for a farm because it's gonna lock me into one approach. I wanna actually continue to learn and work across the sector. And I wanna work for a company that allows me to continue my blog to build my personal brand because that's one of the biggest assets I have for my long-term career. So I took the job with this company and they love my blog and they wanted me to continue to do it. So basically I worked in that job for a year and a half, the blog continued to accelerate more workshops, et cetera. And then I started to get real consulting requests as the market had matured. Suddenly the market had matured to the point where investment was really coming into the sector. The early pioneers had either failed or were raising a lot of money. And so there was a need for 
some serious consulting. Like there was some need for real information. So I got two requests in one week. One was from Deloitte. They had an unused building in Jordan. And they said, we want to know what we can grow in a vertical farm here. And no one has the data. And we you know, we talked to the equipment suppliers and they'll give us data just connected to their equipment. But we really want to know what's possible here, like in an open way. And then the other one was a special needs school in Baltimore that said, we have an unused classroom. We're having some decline in the students for this school. It was a private school for special needs families and youth. And we want to see if we can teach them some job skills like food safety and growing food and also create something that we can market to attract more you know, students to our school and, and create additional value. And I was like, you know what? I can do both of those things. Like, I'm ready. Like, I can consult on both those things. I had, I had full confidence that I could answer these questions and design the farm or answer the feasibility study for both these groups. So I went to my boss and I said, hey, I got these consulting requests through my blog. Do you mind if I just go for it? And... He was like, yeah, go make some money. So we did it. And I basically started to spin off this company within a company. And so I, I, I just continued to do that. And then as it worked, I hired some more people. And so it became, I became the CEO of a company, even though I didn't own the company at the beginning. But that was great because I was able to take risks without my own money. Um, and that's where it went for about two years like that. And then I got to the point where there was enough business that I had to have a very, this was the, the next chapter where I said, okay, I'm ready to go out on my own. Like this is my company basically, right? It's my idea. Everybody's coming from the blog. Everybody's hiring this company because of me and my team, right? So that was the, the, the scariest moment for me because then I had to go to my boss and I had to say, hey, thanks for the support, but actually I want to own this company. <laughs> so I had to speak to a lot of my advisors and I did it. I went and had a conversation with my boss um, and I negotiated a deal where I made him the first investor and we spun off. We merged Agritecture, um, the blog, with the consultancy, which was called Blue Planet Consulting at the time, and merged them. And then that's when we went out on our own. Well. I'm not sure how many, you probably told that story a million times, but thank you so much for recounting it again. Cause I was just like, I was so into that. that that's like incredible. And did you say that the, your first two requests for actual paid work came in in the same week and yes. one of them completely different clients, like a Very private different. school and like one of the, Deloitte's like one of the largest companies in the country, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's one of the big, yeah. That's incredible. I mean, I know they're one of the biggest recruiters at uh, CU Boulder. So um, before we kind of move on to, to where you're at now, I'm really curious, how, how long was it from starting the blog to your first um, paid request? And then, and, then, and then from there, how long until you were able to bring an independent? Okay, so the blog was probably 2010. I think 2010 really was when it started, let's say. Um, and then the first consulting request, I think, was 2014. And then yeah. the when I went out on my own, it was 2017. Yeah, we went on our own. So there are definitely chapters, definitely like a long journey. Um, but that was good for me. Yeah. Are you writing every week? in between that 50 articles a year kind of thing oh my gosh i mean i think we have i mean i think we have we have thousands and thousands of blog posts there's like you know 12 years of content there um and i would definitely be writing yeah and i would be also doing workshops and trying different things yeah and i started getting invited to speak yeah. at things you know i started getting reputation there weren't that many outspoken people in the sector you know the sector you, i was talking about filling a gap right i think one of the gaps i filled was like i was kind of you know, just to be honest, I was kind of young and dynamic in a world of like a lot of older white men. So it just kind of made, and I'm a white guy too, but it just kind of made things, you know, a little bit refreshing for certain audiences. And people really just wanted to tell their ideas. Like urban agriculture is a very emotional thing, right? Like you want to change the world. You want to do something that's cool. You want to do something that's architectural. You want to do something that's good for people, for the environment. It's a and I think a lot of the companies in the sector don't understand that one of the major drivers for business in the sector is hope and optimism and, you know, social entrepreneurship. And I think that that's what I was able to tie into very well as I was able to create a space for people to share those ideas, a person, a, a team of people like me that listened to those ideas and coached you through those ideas that, that was not only helping you get to a more successful 
end, but also was like fun for them and interesting for them and, and, and satisfied that curiosity and passion they had. And no one else was doing that. Everyone else was just trying to like sell equipment or just build boring greenhouses. Right. So now we're, we're five years later from 2017 yeah. and then yeah. there was a little bit of, bit of some rocky stuff in between, but um, where are you at now and how do you choose which projects to get involved with? How do you kind of allocate your time these days? So I think in the first, like, you know, by 2017, we had some clarity on our most popular services, market studies, strategic planning for corporates, feasibility studies, and I would say education work were our biggest ones at that time. Um, so it was about, you know, standardizing those services, right? If you're a consulting firm, one of your biggest problems is your scalability and how you can maintain margins because it's a very people focused business. So people want different things. You never know if your clients can be demanding or not. Uh, and so you really have to watch the hours and the, and the time carefully, or you could get stuck in a deal where you actually make no money or you lose money. So we tried to productize the service as much as possible, uh, standardize them, create templates, make sure we organized all our data, build focus to get on our archive and optimizing that, and really tried to set ourselves up for more scalability. But at the same time, we knew that the sector was still young. So we wanted to experiment. Um, so we did a lot of different R&D, I would say, kind of experiments uh, from different style of events. We, we used to organize big events as well for the industry, not just small workshops. We designed a DIY vertical farming system to test that in the market. Um, a lot of different activities, but we would always practice the same model that we did at the beginning when I started, which is we're going to try something. We're going to try it for six months. If it doesn't work, we're going to dump it. And you know that way you can get ideas out and you can keep innovation in the company, but make sure you don't lose too many resources on, on new ideas. Um, I think that's a, just advice to other people is like you want to create space for innovation, but you want to create a deadline where that innovation has to perform or you dump it so you can focus your energy back on what makes money. So it was really, that was that, that stage was what, the, was what that was about. And it was about getting to profitability because, you know, now we're out on our own. It wasn't just about revenue anymore or getting new deals or learning things. We had to make it on our own. Like we had to create our own money to survive. I didn't have, you know, it was, it was us. Like we were just on our own, a group of millennials mostly, you know, running this business. I think at that time we had maybe six employees in 2017. So, you know, that was that what that chapter was about. And then we got to profitability. We we pushed really um, hard and we focused and I hired some more people and we we got really, really good at it. And the projects just got bigger as the industry matured. And so we started just to really watch key metrics like average deal size, margin per deal, things like that. And we tried to also shift away from just working with entrepreneurs, which were really where we began to start, you know, doing something I maybe should have done earlier. But again, because of my passion for entrepreneurship, uh, but I should have focused a little bit more on people with money. Right. Like, you know, you, I, 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 and so we started servicing a little more investors, you know, and more corporates and helping them with strategy and work as they started moving to the sector. So so that became really good work for us. We were profitable in 2018 and 2019. And then in 2020, we started to take, like in 2019, we started to take our money. This is like where chapter three begins or chapter seven, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> we started taking our money and <laughs> said, how do we scale up even more? Like how do we scale our impact? Like we had achieved, by that point, we had 150 consultations we had done in for like 35 countries. And I was like, wow, like I never thought we would work in that many countries and do that many projects. Like I felt like I was living my dream. But at the same time, it was like, you know, when you're a consultant, not all your farms get built. Um, when you're a consultant, like and you have to push for more premium projects, you start to have to say no to people that have hopes and dreams. And like, it's part of the DNA of the company that we want to make a difference. So he said, let's go digital, right? Like before the pandemic hit, we said, let's go digital and let's create digital tools that have a good margin that can be part of this future. And so we created a couple ones. Um, we started taking all our like workshops and our online classes digital. We started doing a on-demand ask agriculture tool where you can book us for one call. So reduce the barrier entry for like one conversation, um, but they pay in advance and they sort of book that on the, on the platform. And then we said, let's build a farm planning software. Like let's build our feasibility studies online. So anyone anywhere can just like put numbers in, location in, do their own market research and estimate the CapEx, OpEx, yield, water, energy, waste, jobs, number of people you could feed, all these key metrics. Like let's just move past the bullshit and democratize the basics so we can rise the whole industry up. And that was Agritecture Designer. 
And so we started building that and investing our profits into that. And then the pandemic hit, you know, and that was really scary for the company, for lots of companies. But for us, the consulting like dried up. I mean, we just dramatically, we had signed our biggest deal. We sent our biggest single retainer um, in January. And then in February, they still hadn't paid. And then they backed out of the deal. And that was a huge blow for me because I was very excited about that project. And we weren't going to sue them. You know, it's like, what do you, what do you do? It's a pandemic. Like, you know, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. But basically our, our biz, our sales, our leads, everything stopped and consulting just really suffered. And so we sort of said, okay, well, let's push the software faster. We had to get together as a team and everybody had to cut their salaries just so that we didn't lose anybody because I wanted to make sure that the people I'd invested in stuck around. I also want to make sure they had jobs through this unpredictable crisis. So everybody sort of volunteered to cut a certain amount of their salary and we didn't lose any full-time staff. And we sort of went through this like crisis mode where we would just check in. I mean, honestly, on a weekly basis, we just had to have to check in on every single decision in the company to make sure we were watching every dollar, every single move. And we launched the software when it wasn't ready just to test it out and just to give people something to do while they were at home. And that was good. That gave us like some information, some knowledge. And then um, then we sort of, you know, bounced back. I mean, 2021 was our best year ever. And um, and the software, you know, is is humming now. It's still difficult to get it going, but we're, we get new users all the time. We're getting great testimonials. We've launched a bunch of new features. And that's the chapter we're in now is like high, high margin, high quality consulting work. And then our digital activities um, on the software side. Man, you remind me of like every single successful entrepreneur I've ever like watched videos of or read books about like Ray Dalio, <laughs> Simon Sinek, like all, all these people. Like I could like the energy comes through the the camera. It's it's really awesome to hear like your storytelling side. I'm so glad I asked about the story. I think it's so incredible and it's really cool to be talking to you. I know you're you're kind of 12 years in or even more to this journey, but it really yeah. still just seems just like the beginning. You know what I mean? I'm yeah. sure you probably feel yeah. that way as well. Maybe I don't want to put assum- assumptions on you. I do. I think I. I think some people. Sorry, just to say, I think some people no, think please. of business is like very fast. Like especially in like the way VC world works, like they go very very fast. But I work in agriculture, right? So things are just slower in general. And I I love my work, so I'm okay that this journey is taking that long, right? Like I love my job. I don't need to rush it. I'm I'm 35 now, so like it's okay. Like I've got time. But I really do feel like I'm still at the beginning. And just constantly learning new things. And we're just scratching the surface of what agriculture is going to do. Yeah. And you're you're in like a budding industry too. That's another thing. It's not like this well-developed science. It's not like a vehicle manufacturing or something else or oil and gas, whatever. It's it's something that's that's really new. Um, I just want to get really clear. What is like your your goal with what you're doing, your specific like vision that you're heading towards or the mission? Like what is specifically driving you, your main objective? Yeah, we really want to accelerate and empower the transition to smarter and more resilient agriculture. So, you know, it goes back to that original DNA and mission of adaptation, right? We can we can help society adapt to climate change through smarter and resilient agriculture by providing free content on our blog consistently. That's why we do it. We do that all the time because we know that that's something we can do to help other people enter the sector, to avoid common mistakes, to inspire others, to support those that are doing a great job. That's number one. Number two is if you want to do this, if you really want to do this, we have the best services and best team to help you do this. We provide high touch coaching, data, feasibility studies, economics, design, everything you would need to plan your farm business successfully, we have that. So some of those people from this category are going to be serious enough to build a farm. We're there to help you do that, thus helping more farms get built, helping more companies be successful, help the sort of paradigm shift around local and, and, and smart agriculture. And then the last piece is like, If you're on a budget and you just want to test the waters, we have the software now. And what I love about the software is it creates a new way because we have a ton of data in our archive on the consulting side. We've now created accessible data for anyone at a lower cost. So I feel like that's a legacy we're creating. Even if agriculture disappears, we've now created something that forever we have the most urban agriculture models in the world on a single platform. When things get tougher, those models are going to be useful. Right? They're going to be useful to governments, they're going to be useful to corporations, useful to individuals and entrepreneurs. 
Because right now, this is a budding industry and people are excited about it and they see the future of it and people want to pay more for good food. But in the future, it's going to be scarcity, real scarcity in water and food prices and, and, and access to food that's going to drive this industry to the next level. So we're building the infrastructure for that now, right? So that we can be more resilient to the challenge in the future. That's what it's about for agriculture. That's what we want to do. Thank you. Thank you, man. Uh, thinking ahead, I can, I can never get enough of it. So let's, let's talk about kind of how urban agriculture works. So this idea of a control of controlled environmental agriculture, is that specifically talking about indoor food growing? Is that right? Yeah. So the simplest way to think about it is like, just imagine like a spectrum, like a line. And on one side, there's sort of low tech and on the other side, there's high tech. And all of these things in the spectrum could be grown in a city or even outside of a city. But like most of the time, let's just look at urban agriculture. So low tech side, we have like a community garden or even like your backyard garden, but let's just say community garden, you know, something that's more public facing. Then you have a rooftop garden, right? A little bit more high tech because you have to engineer it, you have to fit into the building, you have to really think about design, a little more sophisticated, maybe it's a business. Then you have greenhouses, rooftop greenhouses. Then you have containers, which are indoor production without sunlight. Then you have warehouse vertical farms, and that's the most sort of high tech way to do that. So what you're talking about is controlled environment agriculture, which includes greenhouses and vertical farms. And the philosophy is, you know, sunlight is great, you know, free rain is great, but there's also pests and storms and sometimes it's not sunny. So what if we actually protect the plants and create the ideal environment for them, just like you at home have a thermostat, you know, for your ideal environment to work and live, we're creating the ideal environment for the plant, for the water they need, the nutrients they need, the light they need, the temperature they need, so that they can perform as effectively as possible and they can grow faster in many cases, higher quality. We don't have to spray pesticides on them. So indoor agriculture is sort of like a slang word for controlled environment agriculture. And as far as like energy usage and like the efficiency of growing food, I guess this is kind of like an emerging space. How is it comparing? I mean, I don't I don't know how much space we have outside for growing food versus how much space we have indoors. I mean, I have an unlimited amount of questions, essentially, so I don't even know where to begin. So I guess there's a couple of things just about the food system to understand, right? Like we we don't we're not out of food. Like we actually produce enough food to feed every single human being all the time. Um, the, the problem is, is that we have one billion people that are not getting enough food. They're basically starving and one billion people that are eating too much and are obese. And so the real problem comes from distribution. Right? It's not a problem of volume of food right now. It's distribution. Like Food travels long distances. It's wasted in that journey. There's also issues of access. Food can be expensive for certain groups, but not expensive for others. Inequality. These are, these are the reasons why. Now, that system is now even more at threat, whether it's from you know, the Russian invasion to Ukraine that's affecting wheat prices dramatically and various other food prices, whether it's a pandemic that has affected supply chains dramatically, and whether it's the longer term impact of climate change and the shocks along that journey that are affecting the conditions that produce all of this abundance of food. So what we're really saying is like, let's grow food more efficiently and closer to the consumer, right? And so when you get close to the consumer, you do have less space, right? Because real estate in your cities is more valuable. So the idea is, can we use land that isn't arable, right? Not great for growing outdoors and put a greenhouse on it. Doesn't need arable land. We can grow that without soil. Can we put a vertical farm in an unused basement or unused warehouse near a distribution center since it's empty or a vacant mall since it's empty? Can we repurpose those things into certain food systems? Can we put things on rooftops since people aren't using them? And that's not going to feed all of our food, but what it does is it starts to kickstart a new paradigm for localizing agriculture and converting this idea of our cities as like consumers of food, as partial producers of food. And that's the, that's the sort of developed world perspective of urban agriculture. In the developing world, the impact is even greater because people actually grow their own food and share it in a sharing economy, and it supplements their income, and it becomes a little bit more informal than it is in the developed world, but it's equally important. And you know, by certain estimates, we could grow 10% of all of our fruits and vegetables just in urban areas. If you looked around the city, you could produce 40, 50% of that. So you know, that doesn't solve issues related to protein necessarily, so we need other solutions in the food system. But it is important that we have a supplement of fruits and vegetables and also that people know how to grow food, right? Like if you think about it, if things get worse 
and we have nobody in cities that know how to grow food, how are we going to adapt, right? Like the generations before could do it. We, we, we don't have that ability. And so that's what it's really about. It's about access distribution and using technology to grow more with less. Do we have enough land for, for, for feeding everyone in the future? Actually, no. Arable land is in decline because we're destroying the arable land we have with uh, mostly very negative agricultural practices, which extract the nutrients out of the soil and leave the soil dead. So if we were practicing regenerative agriculture everywhere, we wouldn't have a lot of the problems we have now. But the fact is, we're, we're not. Most farms in the U.S. are large corporate farms. They're extractive. And the, the amazing smallholder farmers around the world are unfortunately you know, not given the investment, not given the support, and not given the attention. So what's the difference between a greenhouse and a vertical farm? And why would someone want to build one or the other? Sure. Yeah. So a greenhouse um, allows natural light to come into the space and a vertical farm does not. Um, a greenhouse, because it has natural light, can allow a lot more variety of plants because plants need a lot of sunlight to grow, especially complex plants. So for example, if you wanted to grow a fig tree, you could grow a fig tree in a greenhouse, potentially. You could grow almost anything in a greenhouse with natural sunlight. You can do corn, you can do all kinds of things. Now, if you you know go in a vertical farm, it's very difficult to grow things that take a long time to grow because I have to pay for every single output of energy that goes into that plant. Um, I have to pay for that. And you had an energy question, which we should get into, because I know you were asking about that. But we have to pay for that to get into the plant. So, you know, why would you do that? Well, if you're growing something like a leafy green, right, a, 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 a lettuce or an herb or something simple, it's kind of it's kind of makes sense that you would want to grow that in a denser, smaller environment as opposed to wasting outdoor land and water for that, because it's it's basically just vitamin water. It, it grows quickly. It, there's no point in spraying pesticides on it because it's just such a, you know, it's such a, a small plant. It, it, it doesn't grow that long. It takes 30 days. So it works in a vertical farm. It still also works in a greenhouse, but the vertical farm, you would do it because you really want to create the right conditions to grow it faster and better and closer to the customer. It also something that perishes quickly. So and when it, you know, most of our leafy greens, let's say on the East Coast, come from Arizona and California, and they're, they die. They're sort of dying as, as they've been harvested, and you're not getting a good product in the market. So you grow it to create a better product for the customer. I mean, bottom line, like it just tastes better, it's more nutritious, and it actually uses a lot less water, and it doesn't need any pesticides. So that's why you do that. However, the energy demand in vertical farms is still too high. And so um, you can't diversify the crops dramatically because the energy is so high. It's one of the main reasons. But also, you can't really call vertical farms sustainable agriculture until the energy solution is an energy problem is solved. Yeah. Well, let's kind of get into that a little bit deeper because I'm imagining even if it was powered by like a solar panel or something, like there, the comparison of a solar panel converting energy and then using LED lights or whatever to grow plants is not going to be anywhere near as much as like the sun just hitting the plant. So how do we, how does that work? How does that eventually become sustainable? And I guess it depends on how much energy each plant uses. I think this is just something an interesting thing to just cover in general. Yeah. Your, I mean, your point about the, the, the loss of energy through trans transferring, right? So solar to an LED light to the plant, that's not an efficient process. Um, but if you get energy from the grid and you put it through the LED, you lose some, but you also can control like what spectrum the plant gets. So you don't need to use as much light. So we often think of plants outside as like getting everything they need, but they also get a lot of what they don't need and they get too much of it sometimes, right? So we think about plants being outside as in paradise, but it's, it's not always paradise for them. It could be paradise, it could be hell. In indoors, you create paradise, right? Because you create the right spectrum for them, and that does reduce the energy use to what you really need. And so that's the main way you're doing it. So LEDs being more advanced to be more efficient is one of the most significant ways that we can reduce that energy consumption. Um, but look, it, you know, even if you covered a rooftop and solar panels on a vertical farm, it would only supply five, 10 percent of that vertical farm, depending on how dense it is. So it just wouldn't make an impact. So it's really about sourcing the energy from renewable sources. If you want to brand yourself as sustainable, if you don't care, if you just want to create a business and sell product, that's fine. Whatever. Get it from the grid. But your products have a higher carbon footprint than even that product that you're getting from California because the energy source is non-renewable. 
So it's really about the source of energy overall, you know. And so if you look at, you know, greenhouses in Canada, they're powered by hydropower. Or if you look at, you know, certain markets that have a lot of renewables, it's not really a problem. Like if there's an abundance of renewable energy and it's affordable, why not use it to grow food in vertical farms? I have no problem with that. I'm I have a problem because I I just want to ask what's the most efficient way to grow food and I just I don't think we can answer that question. I guess it depends on the local area, what kind of food you want to eat. So if 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 we were to think about the most long-term efficient way to grow the best food, it would be regenerative agriculture because regenerative agriculture restores the soil, sequesters carbon, it has the most micro macronutrients in the soil that's going to create the best flavor. But all of those regenerative farms need to be closer to the customer within some reason, right? They don't need to be like next to the customer, but they really shouldn't travel more than a day to get to the customer. So we need to build distributed regenerative farms across the world. And we just, you know, regenerative farms take up more space as well. Like they're they're not, they're, they're efficient from the sense that over time, they're going to produce more abundance. As the soil gets better, you're going to get better quality products, improved yields, everything. You can even do companionship cropping. You can have agroforestry where you have trees producing fruit and leafy greens on the bottom and bushes producing this. But the thing is the investment time is longer. So if I build a vertical farm now, I can get cash flow after it's once it's operating within 30 days. But a regenerative farm, it's going to take me seven years before I really start to get things going. And there's a lot of things that could go wrong because I'm outdoors, storms, pests, whatever, that make it very unpredictable. So investors are going to put money into the thing that is perceived as more high tech and more stable. So it's difficult for regenerative farming to scale and grow. I try to encourage more regenerative farming. But for example, when I try to work with regenerative farmers to bring their data into our software, I say, look, let's bring this in. Let's help you understand hydroponic greenhouses versus vertical farms versus regen farms. They don't even track their data. Like they just don't even practice some of the, in my experience, I haven't who, met who? all of them. Who is this that doesn't track? Re- regenerative farmers, right? They don't like, they don't, they don't, it's almost like, um, it's, it's like, let's care for the land and see what the results are. And let's do what we can with what we have, as opposed to, and that's why agriculture has gone more monoculture, right? Because there's a business that needs to develop around it. And that's why people grow one thing, or why people build big greenhouses, why people build big vertical farms, because you can now predict what's going to happen, right? But like, if you sort of just say, let's have a vari- like a beautiful farm with a lot of variety, you, how are you going to predict the yields? One week, you might have more of this. One week, you have more of that. It's difficult to make a business out of that. Does that make sense, right? Like that's yeah. that's where the challenge comes in, right? And, and so that's why it's going to be difficult to do that everywhere. So in my opinion, it's more about encouraging a diversity of solutions and making sure you're growing something that the market wants. So if you want to do regenerative farming, that's great. You should do that. You should understand what it's going to take. You should understand the risks. You should have enough capital to deal with those risks over time. And you should also, you know, try to find additional revenue streams like agritourism because it's way more beautiful than a vertical farm or a greenhouse. And, you know, but that's that's fine, but you need to know what the market wants. And so it just depends right. on the market. So I think I think for me, I don't think there's one size fits all. I think it's really about encouraging a diverse set of solutions. And for me and my mission, I just want to get people the data they need. And really the next thing that I'm focused on, I would say longer term over the next few years is bringing more soil-based models into our software, again, for that mission of helping us with adaptation. Like, and it's just soil is just a lot more difficult. It's just a lot less predictable. And so that's one of the trade-offs of it. But it can produce huge abundance and quality when it works right. So that's the that's the that's the complexity. It, it, it's all very complexity. I mean, when you're talking about soil, you're talking about a whole universe of trillions of microorganisms doing all kinds of stuff. And here we are trying to be like, put this pipe here, have it drip water in here, we'll get food at this day. Um, and if if you're in business, you under you do under, or if you're deep in business, you understand that kind of data is everything. And there's there is this kind of uh, I don't want to call, I don't know what to call it, like divide between like business and like 
people who are into the environment and into nature. And like, yeah. I really want to like combine the two exactly. together because the power of the human ingenuity with, combined with nature is we can really create heaven on earth. And I think that's really our role as humans is to find a way to do that. But we have to deal with all of our flaws. So do you kind of see this indoor agriculture as kind of like a holdover solution as we adapt to a changing environment, which it, and then eventually the idea would be to have regenerative farms everywhere. Or I had, I had heard somewhere that if we had all regenerative farms, we'd only be able to produce like 36% of the food that we need. But then there's the question is like, we're in America, we're wasting like double yeah. the food. We're making double the food that we need. So like, where is, where is this data right or wrong? I'm not hundred percent sure. Yeah. I've also seen data that if we only grew in regenerative ways, we wouldn't have enough space, but I think it's largely because of our meat consumption, right? If we didn't eat as much meat, we would have enough space, right? So it, it, it's regenerative agriculture for meat production takes up a lot of space, more space than even meat production takes up now. So it really depends on if that data was looking at, you know, meat or just horticulture. So I think that that's, that's important. I think it probably was looking at meat as well, because frankly, more and more people in the world are eating meat, um, despite some of the trends towards veganism, vegetarianism. So again, I think like, I think it, I think it really is about a, a variety of them and encouraging a mature discussion about the trade-offs of each. So when I work with my clients, if they want to build a vertical farm, I'm going to talk to them about soil and how soil performs. I'm going to talk to them about greenhouses. I'm going to make them accountable through giving them information. But the choice in the end is up to them and the kind of business they want to run. That's how I sort of sleep at night and how I do it. But I think the, the other thing I want to mention is like what's exciting now is that the two camps are slowly starting to touch each other. Okay, so my newest article that's coming up is called it's about the hybridization of agriculture. So vertical farming and greenhouses have been like sort of having their hot moment with a lot of investment, a lot of excitement, very sexy, very cool. And region farming is sort of having its own thing, but also like it's a little bit like culty and religious sometimes to some people's perspective. I love it, but but I'm just saying like they, they have an opposition to technology. They're very like, no, 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 no to technology only when we need it. And now we're starting to see, you know, people work in the middle. So we're seeing like agrivoltaics which is soil-based agriculture with PVs on it. The PVs cool the farm. You can have animals on there too. And we're seeing interesting data about that work. We're seeing vertical farms being bought by traditional farmers to produce the seed potatoes for potato production, not for the major production, not replacing the fields, but saving them space to complement their outdoor agriculture. Vertical farming for outdoor agriculture is happening now. And so I think that is a very exciting moment in time where we can say, look, there are all these tools in the toolbox. Let's look at this farm, this location, this city, this market. What does this market need? What works in the climate? What works for you and your budget? And let's not limit ourselves. Let's look at all the tools, right? There's soil-based vertical farms now that have been developed. Soil-based greenhouses as well have been around for a while. So there's really interesting overlap that's happening. And I'm very excited about this moment in time because I think this is our opportunity to start collaborating, creating, and and pushing a more sophisticated discussion on sustainability. Is um, hydroponics and vertical farming the same thing? Hydroponics means you're growing without soil. And so it's called hydro is water. Ponics comes from the Greek word for work. So it means water is doing the work instead of soil doing the work. So you basically create, there's many different ways to do hydroponics. You could do it again, low tech, simplified hydroponics. They do it in Africa, they do it in South America. They did it in Mesopotamia. They did it in you know Egypt. They did it all over the world. Simplified hydroponics um, in in that sense. And then you have high tech hydroponics in vertical farms and greenhouses. So it's really a wide spectrum. But you could do hydroponics outdoors. You could do hydroponics in your garage. You could do it in a commercial farm. Um, but yeah, it's basically without soil. So if you're making a vertical farm outside, can you just build like a skyscraper of food, or, or how would that work? Well, like, I think if we go back to that Deloitte project, like this wasn't outside, but like it was a huge tower in Amman, Jordan, right? And it was like, I told them it's not going to work because of the logistics, right? And also the cost, but you know, you don't want to move food up and down an elevator. So there's ways to innovate around that. But even we've done a couple studies with a lot of sophisticated engineers and the extra labor cost of moving things around. So, you know, Dr. Dixon Apamie, who is the author of The Vertical Farm, which was sort of launched the internet phenomenon around vertical farming, 
he was my mentor at Columbia University. And I remember like being so excited to work with him and we're great friends, but we started to conflict in our ideas because he just wants to make everything like taller. Like I was working on a project and I wanted to make it feasible. So I picked the site in New York and I was looking at Florida area ratio for zoning requirements. I was looking at what the community could spend on the food. And I designed the vertical farm around that. Uh, that was my final thesis project. And, you know, he just kept saying, make it bigger, make it bigger. And I was like, look, like this site actually doesn't allow for the building to be higher than four stories, you know? And I think like there's a utopian idea that's come across through his book, as well as even more earlier than that from certain world fairs that had vertical farms or from the hanging gardens of Babylon that we can sort of engineer these beautiful, stunning things. And I think you can do gardens that way, but it's very hard for me to see how fully functioning farms, you, you don't get that many benefits from going that high. A vertical farm doesn't need to be in Manhattan. It needs to be in like New Jersey or the Bronx. Like right? it doesn't need to be in the city center um, unless it's like for a small group of restaurants, in which case it certainly doesn't need to be a tower. So anything like that that might happen, there might be projects like that that happen in China or the Middle East or certain gimmicks, but that's not the way to build these farms economically. It's just not the way to do it. The, the way you go about thinking this, the style to how you're building your company and trying to grow this space, I find really, really awesome. You're like your your rigid emphasis on like choice, not forcing people to do things, encouraging everyone to do everything. You're like infatuation with innovation, but like deep connection to reality. I find it's like the perfect balance that I could see, obviously. And obviously, man, you're a good looking guy. You, you seem to be in really good shape. I'm really curious. You spend all your time thinking about how to grow food. Maybe like eight years ago now, I went on like the vegan diet after watching this um, How Not to Die presentation by Dr. I need to really figure out his name and give him a shout out. And I've been learning more about regenerative agriculture and, and the benefits of eating meat. And it's, it's a very confusing thing, man, to know what to eat. People are talking about how the apples we eat today are 10% as nutritious as the apples we had in the 1920s. So I'm really curious, like, how do you do like diet? How do you think about that kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, I think I think I don't have a label for my diet. I, I mean, I grew up in Hong Kong, and there's that. like so many senses and smells, and and Japan, it's like I, I swear I probably ate so many toxins and crazy things as a young person. I mean, it's just like it's such a polluted, crazy place that I've always had a very like open mind about food and trying new things, and that's always been something that I, I've just had. Now. You know, I really try to just eat local as much as possible and pesticide free. Those are the things that matter to me the most. So I try to think about restaurants that are supporting local farms because I want to support the industry that I'm passionate about. And that doesn't just include urban farms, it's just local farms in general. So when a, when a restaurant is trying to highlight local farms, or if I can find that communicated in their site, or I just try to take a moment to look for that. And then the grocery store, which I rarely go to because I'm a nomad, but if I do go, I'm really looking for pesticide free <laughs> You know, not necessarily organic, but like, again, destination and pesticide free is what I'm looking for because I just don't want to have additional chemicals I, I, I don't need. And I believe that local agriculture tends to be better because I think there's more accountability between the farmer and the consumer and the customer than there is for ones that are further away. And I think there's just overall evidence that the quality of food does decline as it travels longer distance. Now, the summertime, right? So I'm going to the Czech Republic uh, to be at the countryside in the summer as I do every summer, so it'll be there about two months, you know, I'll be helping my parents garden and, um, you know, I'll be eating from the farm. And so that's what we'll be doing. You know, we just, all of our fruits and vegetables will be basically coming from there. I mean, not our you know, tropical fruits, but we just, we just will be eating all our tomatoes and cucumbers and all kinds of things that we grow there, garlic, pepper, everything. So, you know, that's how I do it. I mean, I, again, you have to understand I travel, I'm in a different country every one to four weeks. So it's, it's really a lot. Um, from a health perspective, I try to exercise frequently. And I just sleep like having enough sleep, even as an entrepreneur is just so important to your health. And sure. I don't know, I think for people's diets, like you can follow these trends, but I would say if you're not feeling sick, like it's not broken, don't fix it. Right. So like, you know, that's, that's sort of how I, I live it. Don't just follow a trend because it's a trend or because you think it's going to have a certain, you know, follow what your body is telling you, like, listen to your body that it's, it, I think it really tells you what you need. Yeah. We were talking about nutritional wisdom a couple of weeks ago. I think that's great that even like basic animals have that. It means we do too. Yeah. Organic mm -hmm. local food S sounds pretty good. Is that down the line when we build out these systems, is that something that could work scalably you think around the whole world at some point? 
I think that there's definitely ways to reduce the pesticide use and the overuse of fertilizers outdoors. I, th I think there's a lot of again lines between where conventional and regenerative are that you don't have to go as far as, as being fully regenerative to or fully organic to have that impact. And I think for me, when I see farmers, like not even just the urban farmers or local farmers that I work with, but I interact with other farmers, I just see them, you know, I just encourage them to start incrementally, like make a change over time, right? Install something that saves, starts to save water. You can save a lot of water in outdoor production with just micro irrigation strategies, right? And people talk about hydroponics and saving water all the time. So a lot of strategies you can save water outdoors, right? We don't need to put everything in hydroponics. There's a lot of different strategies where you can use pesticides that are not as toxic, or you can use companion planting. Um, all of this is hard. I mean, like, again, I don't want anybody to get this wrong. Like agriculture is just so, so hard. And what the farmers do relative to what I do is so much harder. And, and I think like that is something that just constantly humbles me. And, and that's why I'm like, you know, it's very easy to point fingers at a farmer or farming method and be like, oh, that's not good. It's bad for our environment. I think the corporations are the ones we should point fingers at. I think the farmers really try their, their hardest. Farmers never want to harm people or the environment or the animals around them. They just don't want to do that. What have you found to be the largest contributing factor to your success in your career? I think that, you know, my mom is an HR director and she's a big inspiration to me. My dad's an engineer, so that was also part of the inspiration. But, you know, she, she said, without your people, you're, you have nothing in a company, like just with, you have nothing there. And so the biggest thing you can invest in consistently that's going to have an ROI for your experience as a CEO or for your investors or for your company or your brand is your people. You have to have to invest in your people and you have to listen to them. So, you know, I do things now that we've gone fully virtual as a company, I have monthly check-ins with my team and then I have monthly just listening sessions with each of the divisions of my team where they can ask me anything, talk to me about anything. And then I emphasize that I'm available to them. And then we have on Slack a reminder that they can just share their feelings and what, what are you doing today? How are you feeling? Is anything going on? So that people, you got to create space for people to open up and talk about what they're going through. Otherwise you can't help them. And it's so easy to get lost in the work and step on someone's toes or hurt their feelings. And, you know, these are some of the things that I do to try to focus on that. But I also, or prevent problems, but I also just try to mentor them. Like I try to teach them public speaking skills, biz dev skills. I try to encourage them to do special projects. I try to encourage them to be bold and go to an event um, or, you know, try to manifest. I, I try to help them practice writing down what they want out of their careers. I ask them what they want to earn from a financial perspective, which I think is very rare. What do you want to earn next year? What do you want to earn the year after that? What are your goals as far as building a house, buying a house, having a family? So I can know how I can create the salary and the job and the work environment that's going to satisfy you. And you know that I'm there for you trying my best to deliver that. And we're a team to create that value for each other's vision of our future. And so I think like, you know, we have a little bit of like a clan culture as far as, far as our company is concerned. And that's one of the benefits of having a smaller, you know, we're 15, 16 employees now. So there's a benefit of having a smaller company. But that's those are some of the tactics I use. And that, that's really the most important thing for me. And that's also what brings me a lot of the joy. You know, like, you know, because I can't do all this without them. So, you know, we, we have to work together to create that joy and that impact we want to make. No doubt, man. And as you can tell, as I believe you believe, the legend's just getting started, man. So thanks so much for taking the time to join me on the podcast. I think it's been a great episode. Thank you for the great question. Yeah, you got it, man. I'd love to talk to you again and see how everything's going. I think this is a really large emerging space. It's essential. And then um, we, we could probably have a great conversation about how to use technology to heal our soils as well. But before we sign off here, I'd love to just get some final pieces of advice from you for young folks who are just passionate about building a better world. Yeah, look, I have an article on my my LinkedIn as well as online. It's called I Want to Be an Agritech because I get so many questions from young people trying to get into the sector. And I think the tips in it apply to really everyone. So, you know, tip number one is like get hands on experience. Whatever you're curious about, if it's agriculture, get hands on experience. You're going to be humbled if it's agriculture. I had to volunteer at nonprofits. I remember helping a nonprofit in New York like winterize their greenhouse. It just gave me so much understanding of the techniques and the methods and the realities and all of that. So hands on experience, super important. And just volunteer. Just try to just get hands on experience, at least six months of it, and whatever you're interested in, in knowing about. Number two, build your archive. 
Okay, so this is where you have to make sure you capture the information you're learning and store it somewhere. Otherwise, you're going to lose it. You know, you can't keep everything in your head. And so that's that tactic I mentioned earlier, that archive basically is the foundation of what agriculture has done now and something I really recommend other people do when they're exploring a new area. Number three is when you're networking, and this is an important one. Networking is obviously important. You have to network, you have to grow. The key thing I did that was different was I focused on giving first. Okay, so when you network, when you go to an event, you say, oh, my gosh, that's the, the whatever the VP of whatever AI at IBM. I really want to talk to them. Okay, don't think about what you're going to ask them, what you're going to talk to them. Think what you can give them. Like, what's the value you can add to that individual? Can you write a blog post about them? Can you introduce them to someone? And it's very hard, I think, with senior people. But one of the reasons why I was successful is because my blog was an in to everyone. I could write about anyone I wanted to speak to. I could just invite them to my blog and something that you're doing as well. You make these connections by giving first. And what it also does, it creates a position of confidence and people are attracted to confidence. They're attracted to someone who knows what they want, knows what they're doing, knows what they can give. And I think too many people come to me for networking and they just ask me for things. Oh, can you help me get a job? Can you introduce me to this person? I'm happy to help you. But first, like, help me get to know you and help me know what your value is so that I can speak about you in a positive way when you're not in the room. And that comes from focusing on giving first. And then I think the final point, sorry, it's a bit long, but the final point is like on the foundation of all of that is like, you need to, you need to focus on your personal brand. This is something my mom talks about. She has a, a book about personal branding as well, but you know, too many times we struggle, like we think I'm going to get a job and then my brand will be that job. You have to create your brand separate from that and you have to commit to it, right? You have to stick to it because people aren't going to remember you if you don't have a brand. People know what I'm about because I've been consistent about what I'm about for a long time. And you can make that commitment early on as part of your journey of hands-on work and archive building to test the waters for six months. I mean, this is, I'm, I'm about this. I'm the AI you know, sustainability person. This is what I'm passionate about. This is what I do. And just keep that message going all the time, all your LinkedIn content, all your Twitter content, all the events you go to, just live and breathe it and build that brand. And then if you don't feel good about it after six months, dump it and do a new one, right? Just reinvent yourself. Especially if you're younger, you can do that. But if you don't commit, you're not going to really know and no one's going to remember you. Yeah. Well, I, as far as I could tell, you're about being the man. So, so thanks for coming on the podcast. Really great having you. And then one comment on the on the the give piece. I just think not only give first, just give always. I think it's always going to make always. you feel better yeah. about who you are and what you're doing because the way you get is by giving. I've tried to explain this so many times. Enlightened self interest, self giving love. It's in the Bible. It's in the Constitution. It's everywhere. So it's just like it's just really obvious wisdom. And if you follow it, you can see in your life it comes back to you ten times over. And I will keep harping that point over and over again and trying to live that out in my life. Um, Amen. If you want stuff, give stuff. Yeah. So Henry, thanks for coming on the podcast, man. It's been an absolute pleasure having you. Thanks, Issa. Ethan. Take care, everyone. So if you or anyone else you know is looking to buy or sell a home anywhere in the USA and would like to create thousands of dollars in donations without any cost out of pocket, please visit ccrealty.org today.